We are honored to lead off our School of Christian Studies year with Professor Peter Bolin. His title to the uh, presentation is, Who is My Neighbor? A Global Perspective. He asked the questions, and uh, part of his agenda is, who's inside the sacred circle, and who is out? Who gets to decide? How are these questions framed throughout the world in different traditions and cultures? Professor Bolin is the Philosophy and Humanities Department Chair at Southwestern College. He teaches world religions, Asian philosophy, world mythology, and ethics. He's a columnist and an author. Peter's a very frequent speaker and wor workshop facilitator at a number of things where you may have seen him um, around town. Um, for example, San Diego Oasis, the um, Osher Institute of Lifelong Learning at SDSU, Chopra Center, and the San Diego Vedanta Monastery. We now welcome Professor Peter Bolin. You're Thank you. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. Oh, here's your mask. You might want that. You might. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. What a wonderful space on an incredibly beautiful campus. I've lived in San Diego, uh, 1986. I can't do the math. A, a lot of years. And I've, and I've driven by your church 10,000 times, like everybody else in San Diego, but I've never set foot in this place, and that is today rectified, because there's just so many churches in, in, in this wonderful town, and I get to offer talks like this at a lot of them, but I spent a half hour today walking around the campus and going through the empty sanctuary. You know, it reminded me of a line from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, I love the silence of an empty church better than any preaching. Uh, and he was a pre, hey, right? Because I talk in churches a lot, and, and so did Ralph Waldo Emerson, although he did get fired from his minister position. But anyway, that's another story for another day. Yeah, I do teach uh, world religions and world mythology and Asian philosophy and all that stuff to college students at Southwestern College, and I've been doing that for 31 years. But it is really a pleasure to get off campus and to come into places like this where there are communities of people who actually walk in here of their own free will. They don't get a grade or any units toward a future thing, but the good news is there's no homework and there's no essays. I'm not going to have you write anything for me today. But I am just thrilled by this invitation. And as soon as I got contacted, I said yes, because the, the theme of this year-long program, which goes all the way until next April that y'all are doing, is near and dear to my heart. And it's at the center of what first drew me to the study of philosophy and religious studies. And I can't think of anything more pressing today and more relevant today than to consider this question, who is my neighbor? So let's jump in. And as you heard, I'm going to go for 45 minutes or an hour maybe, and then we've saved an, a half hour or more for dialogue. And we have a microphone set up on a stand over there. Somebody will run it around. And I really look forward to any, any comments, any questions you have about anything I've shared or things that are moving through you along these themes. Let's have a good discussion about this when I um, wrap this up at the end here. And I was wondering if that was going to happen. The slides are not moving now. See, we test this meticulously before you all get here. And it, without fail, as soon as we start, things stop working. So we might need to reload this PowerPoint. I don't see anybody that I can talk to about that. OK, good. Um, the remote is plugged into the laptop. And that is functioning. But I could do the whole talk with just this one slide, if you all want to do that. But there's 12 other slides that are, might be helpful there. Thank you. Sound 
We'll go to um, slideshow. Okay. Saves the day. Thank you. We'll edit that part out later. Yay. <laughs> so at the heart of our work this morning, at the heart of our inquiry is this question, who is my neighbor? And the question obviously comes from the very famous parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke, which we'll examine in a moment together in a few minutes. And this question and this inquiry of who is my neighbor, it's a, it's a perspective very familiar to Jesus' audience, since it's an obvious echo of ancient Hebrew teachings. And any one of us could have dug through the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, the, 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 actually from the Torah, this passage from Exodus, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. And this other line from another book from the Torah, Leviticus, God again talking, saying, you must treat the, fo you must treat the foreigner living among you as a native born. Those are really radical words today, aren't they? Today we think a lot about citizenship and papers and process and borders and nationality. This is profoundly seditious to all of that policy talk. You must treat the foreigner living among you as a native born and love him as yourself. For you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. And then like God likes to do at the end of a lot of these passages, just to remind you who's talking. Which raises the question, and I was talking to someone before we got started today at, at one of the tables about this. Why, why do we have to be reminded of this over and over and over again? This is not a new moral standard, this idea of treating everyone like your neighbor. Why does it not stick? And I don't have an answer for that question. There's something about human consciousness that is multi-level, and part of us in that limbic system of our brain, we think a lot in terms of flight and fear and combat and othering, and we all have that. Perhaps it's a result of our biological conditioning, our Darwinian evolution, that in order to stay alive, it's it's, it's actually biologically beneficial for me to be afraid of you a little bit. Especially if I don't know you and you're not from us. You know, my dog at the park loves all the dogs that he knows, but the dogs that he doesn't know, he's a little standoffish. I'm not saying we're dogs. <laughs> it was a very loose analogy. I'm working without notes here. I'm just thinking about my dog. And so... Let's forgive ourselves a little bit for our amazing ability to forget to love our neighbor. However, we gather in conscious communities like this, churches and ashrams and mosques and synagogues, to remember. To remember our authentic connection with one another. And now I'm thinking a little bit about the news. And I know you watch the news too, and this guy's in the news a lot lately. This is the governor of Florida, of course, Governor Ron DeSantis. Now, some of you might be getting nervous right now. Oh my God, he's gonna start talking about politics. And I wanna take that up today a little bit too. Our fear of discussing policy and practice. Because we've been trained our whole lives, right? In polite society, you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about politics, which is hard for me because those are the two things I'm really excited about. But I'm not here to pick on any particular leader or any particular party. I just want to remind you of what you've probably all been reading in the news the last few weeks. And this is an ongoing red hot story. If I ever do this presentation again, I'll have to get rid of this slide and put some new guy in there. Yeah, or woman or whatever. 
So we all know that the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, for some reason got involved in some immigrants that had come into Texas and contacted some of his friends and scraped together $615,000 to charter two private jets to load 48 Venezuelan refugees onto these two charter jets. And then they gave these refugees a packet of paperwork that told them they were gonna go to some other city, Chicago or something, and there were gonna be services there. For Instead, they dumped them on a tiny island off the coast of Massachusetts called Martha's Vineyard, which is where, by the way, Barack and Michelle Obama have a summer home. And there's a little bit of a whiff of that, of like, let's own the libs by sending these refugees to their little private island. At a cost of $12,815 per refugee. So just from a pure conservative fiscal basis, this is some bad travel planning. And by the way, he's not alone. We know that the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, and the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey, other, two other Republican governors, have also done this same thing. Loaded up planes of refugees, of immigrants, and sent them off to Chicago and New York. I believe it was Greg Abbott or Ducey. I can't keep it straight. I, I pay as much attention as I can bear. <laughs> but one of them sent... A, a batch of refugees to Vice President Kamala Harris's house in Washington, D.C. And so this is a kind of political stunt, isn't it? It's a kind of let's send them to these democratic strongholds. And where might such an idea have come from, you might ask? Well, in July of this summer, Fox News personality Tucker Carlson planted the seed. He suggested the idea as an ironic aside. He's like, you know, we should just put these people on planes and, and, and ship them off to these democratic places. And so there's a curious, and we're all watching this, right? There's a curious feedback loop between certain media voices and certain political leaders. And this happens on the left as well, of course. But we're thinking today about refugees and about those who are outside trying to get inside. And so what happened next, of course, was rather, I don't know, this is, this is the reason I'm taking you through all this story is because what happened next? When those Venezuelan refugees landed at Martha's Vineyard, which by the way, as you probably know, is a tiny little place, mostly summer homes. So, in the, so by the time we get to this time of year, it's largely empty. There's like 2,000 people that live on this island. It's like sending them to Catalina or something like that. So what happened was the Episcopalian church there on Martha's Vineyard and other church groups and some government agencies met the refugees. They called the high school. They got all the AP Spanish high school students over to do the translation. They set up tables. They started feeding everybody. They started clothing everybody. And they brought medical assistance as well. And they set up, you know, they emptied out a building at their church, a building, a room like this, and set up cots and built a shelter. And the, the refugees were only there for two days before they were moved to the mainland to an Air Force base. The governor of Massachusetts took over. But it, in a way, as a political stunt, kind of backfired because then we suddenly have this contrast. And I am the last person who wants to start pontificating about who the true Christians are. You're not going to hear me do that today, because that's a dangerous ground. So we'll just sort of present what happened and leave the question hanging. Who of all these various groups best embodied Jesus' question or Jesus' response to the question, who is my who is my neighbor? Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, and here's a photograph of the, these Venezuelan re refugees on one side of the table and the folks of Martha's Vineyard on the other side helping them out, opening their homes, not wondering where, that, where the money was going to come from because it's a tiny church on Martha's Vineyard. And it's pretty scary to have 50 people show up and you're like, how, how, how are we going to pay for all this? Well, you know how it works. 
the parable of the loaves and fishes, right? GoFundMe campaigns appeared out of nowhere, and people all over the country began sending money to this church in Martha's Vineyard. It ended up being profitable for them. They're set for the rest of the year now. So I want to think with you about something that I know is on your minds if you are members of this church community, because this church community walks the walk also, as do many other church communities in this city of ours, of daring to step into arenas that some churches are afraid to step into. Look, I, I have absolute sympathy for every church leader who is agonizing about this question today. How much can I talk about politics from the pulpit? And you're kind of legally prohibited from talking about it too much. And yet, aren't there moments when it seems like that's exactly what needs to happen? So churches everywhere struggle with the challenge of keeping religion and politics separate for all of the obvious reasons, and I'll state a couple of those obvious reasons. Maybe they're not that obvious if you don't think about it a lot like, like I do and others do. Um, let's start at a very basic level. You don't want to alienate half your con congregation. Church is already struggling to grow. Churches, church communities are already aging out. And many church communities, as we know, are shrinking. So the last thing you want to do is get up on the, po on, on the pulpit in the big room next door on Sunday and start railing about this candidate or even mentioning the name Ron DeSantis. Because there are going to be people in the room who have great sympathies for him. As you may know, if you watch politics, he is a very likely leading Republican nominee for the President of the United States. If tr the former twice impeached guy can't somehow claw his way back in. So who knows? You know, maybe this isn't the time to go on a campaign against Ron DeSantis from the pulpit of a church. And there are other reasons as well. Um, most agree that it is inappropriate and in some cases illegal, and I'm no lawyer, and I don't know tax law and all the 501c3 da-da-da-da stuff. Uh, but it is illegal for churches um, to take positions on specific ballot measures or candidates, although many churches, of course, and many pastors violate this norm. And they tell their congregation to go vote for this person or to go vote against that proposition. But you can see how impossible this is. Because our politics are where we manifest our values, are not our politics, our policies, and our institutions of governance a manifestation of our values? And are not our values shaped by our morals? And are not our morals informed by our religious experience and faith convictions? So I see this unbreakable link between what I experience from God's grace in my meditation, in my prayer, in my own moral conscience, I see an unbreakable link between that and how I vote. And I suppose you do too. And so it's uncomfortable at best when we gather in religious communities to have this taboo against talking about the very mechanisms that enact our morals and our values. I don't know how to fix this, but this is the tension that I feel and that a lot of us feel around all of these issues. And so for these reasons, I, I'm trying to argue for the claim that it is precisely the purview of religion and religious leaders to take positions on fundamental questions of how we treat one another and let the chips fall where they may. Did the Reverend, yeah, okay, you can clap for that if you want. <laughs> Does Reverend Warnock stay neutral when he went to the Senate? His former career was preaching in MLK's old church in Atlanta, right? Was Dr. King neutral? Go back and read the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail where he says the biggest problem 
preventing us from finally creating social justice is the white moderate liberal, liberal who stays silent. I mean, he names names. Silence is complicity. And so now with all of that modern angst in the air in this room right now, let's turn to some of these ancient principles as they appear in the Western traditions and in other traditions as well. And finally, uh, you know, sometimes it is necessary for religious leaders to humbly but clearly rebuke the wrongdoer. I love that word, rebuke. <laughs> it's this wonderful old biblical word, right? It sounds confrontational. And there's a right way, I suppose, and a wrong way to do it. Not from a position of arrogance or I have all the answers and you're an idiot, which is how most social media dialogues uh, degenerate about these issues the troll, but in real conversations between thoughtful people, it is on good men and women of conscience like us to find ways to talk to people who disagree with us and find an empathetic thread that connects us and then build from there. So you know I was going to go here, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and it's one of the most familiar parables. If you've been around Christianity for a while, you've heard it a hundred times on Sunday mornings, and maybe you've read it yourself in all the different translations. I want to just take a moment and in three slides tell this story or share this passage from the Gospel of Luke. And I'm using the New Revised Standard Version. So here it is. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Some translations say a Pharisee, which is one of the main sects of Judaism in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, this is, this is so Great. This is like a philosophy professor, right? Whenever a student asks me a question, I say, I ask them a question. It's like when I'm on a plane and somebody turns to me and we start talking about our careers and they find out what I do and they say, some, sometimes they say, so, do you believe in God? I'm like, oh, here we go. And I say, well, what do you mean by God? <laughs> See? And now all the way to London, we actually have a conversation about interesting things, because I need to know what definition of, of God are you asking me to thumbs up, thumbs down? It's an interesting question, obviously. So anyway, Jesus says to this guy, what does the book say? And he means, of course, the Torah. And so this expert in the law, and by the way, whenever you see the word law, in the Gospels, you know that it is a strange way of translating the word Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. So what does it say in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers? And the guy knows his book, and he says, he just pulls a quote out of, Le of Leviticus or Deuteronomy or somewhere. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. So that's the student's answer to the teacher when the teacher says, what do you think you have to do to inherit eternal life? And I'm not going to even unpack what eternal life means right now. That's above my grade. I'm not a the theologian. You can bring whatever your understanding is here. What I want to focus on is this, is, is this next moment. Because after that exchange, then the student says, no, sorry, then Jesus says, right answer. Head of the class, love, your, love God and love your neighbor. And that's sometimes called the twin commandments of Christianity, isn't it? That's what you need to do as a Christian. It's so simple. Have some kind of authentic relationship with, with what is holy and take care of the people around you. <laughs> That's it. You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. 
But like a good philosophy student, this law expert is not done. He's got, sir, I have a follow-up question. But, and, and the author of Luke puts this strange qualifying phrase in, but wanting to vindicate himself, that seems like a little editorial remark there, but anyway, the student says to Jesus, okay, but who is my neighbor? And here we are in the theme of this entire academic year curriculum that you all have created here. And I'm so thrilled I get to launch it or sink it on day one. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll see how it goes. Who is my neighbor? And doesn't, doesn't the hair on your arms kind of stand up when you, when you read that? Like, that really is the crux of the matter. Okay, I get it. I have to love my neighbor. Who is that? Is it the person who lives near me? Are we being going to be literal here? Is it the people who look like me? Is it the people who vote like me? Is it the people of my socioeconomic class? You know, I live in a nice suburban neighborhood, and there are increasingly, as many of us experience in our nice suburban neighborhoods, if you happen to live in one of those, there are increasingly, I'll call them urban outdoorsmen, living in the park. The unsheltered. The victims of late-stage capitalism, my leftist friends might say. People who live out of their cars for a while until the car needs a new transmission, and then they're living in the, under the underpass. And I walk by them every morning when I walk my dog. One of them parks next to a dumpster down by the park, kind of hiding there. Another one backs his car into a kind of an overgrown shrub area, and I think they're building a little tent city underneath all the trees back there. Are those guys my neighbors? So it's a really great question, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus answers him, but he doesn't answer him, does he? He tells a story. This is what Buddha does all the time, too. So we could do a whole thing here about why parables. Why telling a little story, a little made-up story about fake people, about stuff that never happened. Why painting a little narrative picture for the guy? Why that is so potent and conducive to transformation? Because Jesus just could have easily turned to him and said, everybody's your neighbor. Move on. But he didn't do that, did he? He engaged the student's imagination and took the time, and it was only a minute or two, to create some kind of symbiosis, a kind of interchange of consciousness through the time that it takes to draw someone into a story. So Jesus tells this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, footnote, very dangerous road, a road beset by thieves. It was hard to get down this road and not get beaten and robbed. Everyone in the audience knows that. We don't have that context, so it's probably worth inserting. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest, a Sadducee, you know, someone who was involved in the liturgical life of the temple in Jerusalem, a religious officiant, an expert in religion, a theologian, if you will. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the beaten man dying, he went to the other side of the road to go around him, kind of like I do with those homeless guys in the park. I don't go up to them and say, hey, how you doing? I'm Peter Boland. I live a couple doors down. Come on and have a swim in the pool. I don't know why I do, don't do that, but I kind of do know why I don't do that, but I don't do that. So I, I don't want to paint this priest as the villain of the story. It's a very human response. Many of us would do exactly that. 
And it's a little bit like a joke, right? A priest, a rabbi, and an imam walk into a bar. <laughs> That's that three-part thing you do in storytelling. So Jesus is like, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. We're walking down a road. It's the same structure, isn't it, in this story? Jesus knows how to tell a parable. And so the second guy, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. And I know a lot of you being educated, being connected to Christianity, maybe most of you, I, I'm, I'm assuming, are well aware of this context and who the Samaritans are. And the Samaritans have been warring with the Hebrews. These are two distinct groups with great animosity. In fact, the Hebrews had recently burned down a Samaritan temple nearby. So these are warring factions. And everybody in this audience where Jesus is talking who are Hebrews, when they hear the word Samaritan, their hackles are going to come up a little bit. It's like saying Nazis or something, right? But who's the good guy in this story? Yeah, the Samaritan. The Samaritan came along and had compassion. And Jesus said, the Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with very expensive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, presumably walking alongside, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And then, presumably overnight from the context here, the next day he took out two denarii. Let's modernize that. The next day he took out his visa and he told the concierge, run this card and take care of this guy. And when I come back, I'll repay you uh, whatever more you spend. And then Jesus asks the philosophical question to the expert of the law. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Is there any possible answer? I mean, talk about being led by the nose to a foregone conclusion, and the guy's no dummy, he says, the one who showed mercy. That's the one who treated the stranger like a neighbor. So Jesus simply says, go and do likewise. The end. Jesus does not give a long, learned, theological or philosophical explanation. There's no metaphysics here. There's no epistemology. It's it's almost as if Jesus is pointing this student to a self-evident conclusion that a child would understand. And yet, that takes me back to the question I posed earlier. Why do we have to be reminded of this over? And as soon as we see it, we're like, yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. Go and do like likewise. So... With that in mind now from the Abrahamic traditions, I want to think with you a little further about that story and, and, and take it through a couple of other different traditions. I, I would love very much to come in here and talk about who is my neighbor from the perspective of every, every religion, every philosophy, and every culture. But I think a few examples will suffice to demonstrate the absolute universality of this ethos of care for the stranger. And any of you who have traveled, and I don't mean just staying at the Marriott everywhere you go, but every one of you who has traveled off the main roads and in the more rural world have experienced a kind of hospitality you don't often see in the United States, where people who are starving and have nothing and have two bites of food left will give you one of those bites because there is a fundamental faith that more is on the way. Talk about grace. So what can we say about that parable? It doesn't take a theologian to see that Jesus is clearly challenging the colloquial definition of the word neighbor and seditiously deconstructing the very notion of othering or us versus them 
consciousness. And if Jesus doesn't challenge us and is just about making us feel good, then we might not be looking close enough. That it isn't just for comfort that we come to religion. We come to be changed. Metanoia, right? Which is sometimes translated as to be reborn, but it really means new thinking. Just a new set of ideas, a new mind, new understandings. And this story is a story about metanoia, isn't it? It's a story about thinking about the stranger differently. And it seems to me that the parable of the Good Samaritan establishes hospitality as the core Christian virtue. One of my Christian friends puts it this way. You know, he's a little disappointed that for many Christians, Christianity is a little more than an afterlife reservation system. Ouch. An afterlife reservation system. As long as I get to heaven, thank you, Jesus. But stories like this suggest, although the word eternal life was packed in the beginning of the story, so there's a little bit of a thread there, but especially among his Jewish audience, and a lot of you know this about the evolution of Judaism, in the time of Jesus, there wasn't really much of a doctrine of afterlife in Judaism. That comes a little bit later and really takes form later, but that in, in, in much of Jewish thought, it is in the here and now that we live in the kingdom of God by the way that we treat one another. We'll let the afterlife take care of the afterlife. And so what if that's the most important thing about being Christian is practicing hospitality? Not right beliefs, but right action. You know, our friends, the Southern Baptists, if you want to join a church like that, you have to sign a creedal statement that you believe this and this and this and this and this, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, that you're going to read the Bible literally, that you're going to be a creationist. It's different in the Methodist community, I know, and in many other Christian communities. But what does it take to be a real Christian? Do you have to believe X, Y, and Z? Or is it more important not what you think or believe, but who you are, how you live, how you take care of others. Father Richard Rohr talks a lot often about the contrast between orthodoxy or right beliefs and orthopraxy, right actions. And so I'm challenged by that too. And so in this story, we've seen that hospitality for the stranger, the other, is a core value in Judaism and Christianity. So what do other traditions like, say, Hinduism or Buddhism teach about our interconnectedness and commitment to compassion? Well, I feel a little bit like, uh, like we're still in the Good Samaritan story. You already know the answer to that question. Even if you don't know a lick about Hinduism and Buddhism, you know where this is going. But let's get into some of the details anyway, because I think it's fascinating. Let's start with Hinduism, which is the far older of the two. So what is Hinduism? Hinduism is, of course, the religion of ancient India. And it's big and it's complicated. It's really, the word Hinduism is an umbrella term uh, under which exist dozens of different darshanas or schools. Of thought, it's like it's like Christianity, right? And then there's a thousand different denominations of Christianity underneath that umbrella term. So it's a little bit hard to summarize too quickly about what Hindus believe and what they think and what they do, but we can try. In fact, the word Hinduism is a conquest word. It's not what they call themselves. The word Hindu comes from a Persian mispronunciation of the Shindu River, which was the name of the river in modern-day Pakistan that they came upon. And they called the language that, the river that, the people that, and the religion that. And it became Hindu, Hinduism. What do people in India call their own wisdom traditions? They call them the Sanantana Dharma. 
the Sanantana Dharma, and I'll try to translate that. That's Sanskrit. Um, it's usually translated as the birthless, eternal truth. <laughs> pretty, pretty big idea, right? Dharma means uh, a lot of things. It kind of means the same thing as, as the, the logos, you know, the order, the structure, the pattern, and also our moral obligations. So the Dharma means the truth of reality, and Sanantana means unborn. That means it was never born, it will never die. I guess we would just use the word eternal, birthless and deathless. So that's what they call their own wisdom traditions, eternal truth. And there are a number of texts that come out of ancient India. The, first of all, the Vedas, and they go back um, 2000 BC. Some in India say much earlier, but the earliest written form we find is, is around the time of Abraham. Abraham lived about 1800 BCE, and there were no biblical texts at that time. The Bible's going to get written much later than that. But in ancient India, they're already writing these texts called the Vedas, and that's where you read a lot about a bunch of different gods, kind of a polytheistic system. And then a little bit later, maybe 500 BC, again, around the time of Plato and Socrates and Confucius and Lao Tzu, and the Babylonian exile, around that time, a new set of texts called the Upanishads comes along and they shift the perspective. The Vedas were about, you know, let's figure out how to appease all of these gods out here. Here are all these prayers and, and petitions. But by the time we get to the Upanishads, the whole project of Hinduism had shifted. And the realization became that whatever the divine sacred cause of the universe is, is present within me. And that the best way to learn about divinity or ultimate reality is not to look out here, but to go within. Through meditation, through sacred service, through the various yogas, to realize that I am one with that holiness. The same way Jesus talks to us in the Gospel of John, I believe, where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Or when Jesus says, when they ask him, show us where the Father is, and he says, when you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. I and the Father are one. And I am the vine and you are the branches, and you and I are one. That's almost a kind of non-dualistic Hindu perspective and it's it's quite startling when you run across it in the in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures then a little bit later there's a, a third book called the Bhagavad Gita and these are the three main scriptures of Hinduism the Bhagavad Gita written around the time of Christ and this is the famous story of of uh, Krishna who is the Jesus of Hinduism or should I say one of the many Jesuses of Hinduism in Hinduism Lord Vishnu sends forth avatars or incarnations many, many times. Rama, Buddha, Krishna. He takes human form, born of a woman. It's the exact same story as the one we have in Christianity. And so Krishna is a man, a person, but he's also the human form of Lord Vishnu. And he, he um, pals around with his friend named Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, and they... Uh, end up being in a battle, and there's a lot of philosophical discussion around that. That is really a powerful text. So out of those sources come this complex, interconnected web of philosophical and religious perspectives and practices known in the West as Hinduism. And at the heart of Vedanta, and again, Vedanta is, is the philosophy of the Upanishads, that business about all is one. At the heart of that is the idea of monism or, if you will, non-duality. Namely, the idea that all matter, all energy, and all consciousness emerges from a single underlying ground of being called Brahman and remains interconnected, remains identical with it. Everything you see, everything you experience, feel, taste, touch, know, is an aspect of Brahman here in the field of time. The image is often used of an ocean. It's as if 
you and I are all waves on the surface of the sea. And I'm rising up over here, and you're rising up over there, and you're rising up over there. And we all think that we're separate from one another. But what's really happening is we are all just the ocean waving. And we forget our fundamental connectedness, interconnectedness, because we fall asleep, because we've been embodied in these separate meat sacks, and they all look a little different, and we talk different and think different. So according to Buddhism, which we'll get to next, we've all kind of fallen asleep into an illusion of separateness. And that's just really how it feels. So our own subjective experience affirms the dream that we need to awaken from to come into the embodied realization of our oneness. So that Brahman idea is sometimes written as Brahman Atman. And Brahman then is, again, the formless, sacred ground of all forms, the ground of being. And Atman is the same thing as Brahman. I'm sorry, there's two words for the same thing. Are you with me still? Atman is simply the presence of Brahman within sentient beings. And the Atman was never born and it will never die. It's eternal. Arjuna tells Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, there has never been a time when you did not exist, nor will there ever be a time when you cease to exist. Now, when Krishna says that to us, he doesn't mean this Peter Bolin guy is eternal, but the Atman within is birthless and deathless. And to have my identity there to put my, to have my being there, as Paul tries to struggle to explain God to that Athenian crowd in the Acts of the Apostles, and he quotes some Greek poetry, and he says, you know, God is, is, is where we live. God is not this thing up here. God is where we live. It's where we breathe. It's where we have our being. It's the wa if, if we were fish in, in an aquarium, God would be the water, according to Paul. And so that's a kind of non-dualistic way, a kind of Hindu way of talking about ultimate reality, that each of us is the presence of Brahmanatman. And this is the metaphysical foundation of everything else in Hinduism. And it leads, of course, as you've already, you're already several steps ahead of me, as always, because I move too slow, uh, this leads to an ethical edict, I would say, an ideal, namely that each of us is an expression of one sacred reality and start acting like it. Start treating yourself with love and compassion and mercy. Start treating everybody else as if they are a visiting deity. Because in this tradition here, they are. And I think that's clear in the Good Samaritan parable as well. Even the people who you find repulsive and dangerous. And that's what the namaste gesture is, right? We've all seen this. The namaste gesture and that word namaste embodies everything I've just said for the last five minutes. It's this idea that when you say namaste with someone, you are not just saying hi although you are kind of doing that too, it's pretty colloquial greeting, namaste, hello. But underneath the surface, and us philosophical types, we always wanna go there. Underneath the surface, it's actually an acknowledgement of this metaphysical claim that when you and I meet in namaste, in authentic dialogue, what Martin Buber called the I and thou, that is not two people looking at each other anymore. That is God apprehending God. And I kind of vanish. I become an instrument through which God shows up. You know, the St. Francis prayer. Make me an instrument. Make me a channel. That idea. So... In Hinduism, then, it is our dharma, it is our duty to live out our sacred purpose by serving one another. So there's your answer. How does Hinduism approach this who is my neighbor question? 
well, it, w with a five pound hammer, that's how it approaches it. You know, this, they just pound you over the head with this idea, there is no such thing as the other. You are two aspects of one thing. Thus, strictly speaking, there is no other. We are all aspects of one divine underlying reality. I forgot to mention at the top, I would be very happy to email all of you this PowerPoint presentation if you would like it. All you have to do is email me and ask me for it. So uh, you can find me um, at peterboland.com. That's my website. Yeah. Two, two uh, L's, exactly. B-O-L-L-A-N-D. Um, and when you're on the website, there's a contact button. Drop me a note and say, hey, I was at the who is my neighbor thing. Can I have the PowerPoint? And I will send it to you in a day or two. So I did want to mention that. Sorry. I forgot at the top. Okay, let's, let's turn to Buddhism for just a couple minutes. This won't take quite as long. Uh, Buddhism came right out of Hinduism just as Christianity came out of Judaism, right? In fact, there's a lot of interesting parallels between Jesus and Buddha. They were both born into an already established ancient tradition. And they grew up in that tradition and loved that tradition and stayed in that tradition their whole life. You know, it's sometimes kind of mind-blowing to a lot of my students to learn that Jesus was a Jew. That he was born a Jew and that he died a Jew and he stayed and he was a Jew every minute of his life. <laughs> and that there was no such thing in Christianity in the time of Jesus. That's really disturbing to a lot of my students. But it's an important starting point to understand that what you and I experience as Christianity grew out after the death of Jesus, largely from the writings of Jesus' contemporary Paul, whose letters we know very well from the New Testament, etc., cetera, et cetera. Same dynamic here, Siddhartha Gautama, born into the Hindu tradition, thousands of years old, grew up in it, educated in it, um, although 500 years earlier than Jesus. And he comes to be known because he has some transformational experiences. He becomes enlightened. So he becomes known by this nickname, the Buddha. And in Sanskrit, Bud means to awaken. So Buddha literally means the guy who woke up, the awakened one. And I for our purposes today, thinking about this question of who is my neighbor, I think what's fascinating about Buddhism is that it takes all of that Hindu metaphysics that I just took you through, from Anatman and all that stuff, and it takes it to a kind of deeply psychological and practical level, like a real world level, like what does this look like if you really live like that? And Buddhist teachings begin with the acknowledgement of the impermanence of all forms. Again, not new to any student of religion or philosophy. The idea that all forms arise and all forms fade. And by form, we mean not just material things like this wooden lectern or my body, but ideas are forms. Political philosophies are forms. The United States of America is a form. It's existed for 240 something years. I don't know how much longer it's going to exist. <laughs> I have no idea. One more year? 400 more years? Who knows? But we know it's not eternal. As students of history, every empire comes and goes. Sometimes it takes 600 years. Sometimes they last 200 years. I don't know how long we have. But to assume that the United States of America is a, is a marble, eternal entity is naive. It could end. This experiment could end. And that's what drives all of us to you know, read the news a little more carefully. So all forms are impermanent, as unpleasant as that is to say yes to. <laughs> uh, and the interdependence of all phenomena, that's another key point that Buddhist philosophy hammers on, that all things arise interconnectedly and interdependently. Nothing is the single cause of something else. A phenomenon usually has a thousand mothers. Anybody here watching the Ken Burns series, The U.S. and the Holocaust? Good, okay. 
If you haven't, go to the, go to the PBS website and watch that. It's a fascinating and very difficult to watch. I've only made it through an episode and a half, and it's four episodes, four two-hour episodes. It's really hard to understand, and I want to use that as an example of Buddhist interdependence. And the, um, the point that Ken Burns and the other producers make is that the Holocaust, and I, this is challenging because I've been thinking this way my whole life, the Holocaust is Hitler's fault. Or maybe Hitler and the other people who ran the Third Reich, they did it. But what Ken Burns shows is that who we were as Americans in the 20th century gave birth to Hitler. When we read Mein Kampf, we read there how he was really excited about the pseudoscience of eugenics, which came out of Britain and really caught fire here in the United States. People like Teddy Roosevelt, Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood. A lot of leading thinkers believed in eugenics, which was, again, the quack theory that some physiology, some people of some physiologies are superior to other people of other physiologies. It's kind of a fancy word for white supremacy. And that began because it became so normal in America to, to believe in eugenics, it got woven into our immigration policy, starting with the Chinese Exclusion Act and all of the other restrictions on immigration. Ron DeSantis's Italian family arrived here before that, when immigrating to America meant just getting off a boat and walking on to America. There were no immigration policies or processes, passports. And Adolf Hitler writes in Mein Kampf how thrilled he is by the American commitment to anti-Semitism, to eugenics, and to white supremacy. And he is, you know what he especially admired about America? Was the way we got rid of the Native Americans. Drove them out of their lands, slaughtered them, and the few left that were alive, caged. And Adolf Hitler writes in Mein Kampf, said that was unpleasant but necessary. And I, it, it, it pains me to say this, that we taught Hitler how to Holocaust. This is what certain voices on the right don't want you to know because it's hard. They don't want our children to be educated about these things because it makes America look bad. But I don't know, I have a different reaction. I think of it in this Buddhist sense that as Abraham Joshua Heschel puts it, not all are guilty, but all are responsible. None of us alive today created these systems of oppression, but people who look like me benefit from them as a tall, straight, white, male, native English speaker, every room I've ever walked into my whole life, I had a head start over every woman in the room, over every person of color, over every person who had a native language different than mine. So I didn't earn any of that. It's just the structures that we were all born into. Buddhism has a really sophisticated metaphysical explanation for this, that the world that we live in was created by many, many, many elements and forces and voices, and it's impossible to trace it back and blame it on that guy. But what's exciting to me is once I become aware of these things, I know a little bit better what to do next. And who are we going forward is the more fascinating question, isn't it, than all the junk that we've done. But until one tells the truth, there can be no reconciliation. A lot of people want to jump right to the reconciliation. Oh, stop talking about that stuff. Let's just all get along. But as South Africa tried 
to undo apartheid. They did it right. They spent years talking, telling the truth first. Just like in our own journey to forgiveness for the sins we've committed, it starts with just telling the truth, owning it. Only then can real healing begin. So Buddhism has an interesting take on all of that. But once you understand the interconnectedness, the logical conclusion is karuna or compassion. You realize that even your enemy is caught up in a system that they did not create. And they too are lost and scared and acting inappropriately. And so Buddhism teaches us to practice ahimsa, which is non-harm, non-violence, causing as little harm as possible. And also to practice right action in the way we work, in the way we talk, in the way we act. And to take the bodhisattva pledge. Buddha is a bodhisattva. There are many in Buddhism. Bodhi means illumination. Sattva means being. We are all called to be bodhisattvas, awakened beings who take the bodhisattva pledge, which is simply this. I vow to work for the alleviation of the suffering of all sentient beings. That's why I'm here. I work and I vow to help alleviate the suffering of all sentient beings. In Judaism, that's called tikkun olam in Hebrew, right? Tikkun olam means to heal the world. That we are called by God to participate in the healing of the world. I don't need to tell you where the woundedness is. It's everywhere you look. And we can't fix it all. But you can contribute and that's the Bodhisattva Pledge. That's treating everyone like my neighbor. So to wrap up, one question I think rings throughout the world's wisdom traditions. And really it's, <laughs> it's at the, in the first pages of the Bible, right? Remember that scene where, where, uh, where God comes to Cain and says, where's your brother Abel? And Cain's like, like a sullen 15-year-old, you know, he says, what am I, my brother's keeper? So it starts right there with the Cain and Abel story. The meltdown begins, the competition for, God, for, for the Father's love. So in all the world's major and minor religions and throughout world culture, the moral rectitude of hospitality is affirmed. I just want to anchor it to that one word, hospitality, because it's such a friendly, simple word, right? We all instantly know what it means. And I think we've learned through our long evolution as human beings that our fate as individuals is inextricably bound together with our fate as a community. And as the virtue of self and, and, and the virtue of self-sacrifice for the good of others is, is universally championed and celebrated in all cultures. And the understanding that that what happens to me happens to you. That interdependence, that's wisdom. And we recognize that wisdom as well, wherever we go. The Dalai Lama kind of sums it up nicely, that compassionate action is the ultimate form of self-interest. Kind of closes the loop there. Because often in Western philosophy, you're, you're, you're either an altruist and you're sacrificing everything for, for the other, or you're an egotist and it's all for me. And that's a false binary. So I love what the Dalai Lama does. He takes that straight line and turns it into a circle. Actually, it's in your interest to take care of other people for a lot of reasons. So finally... I want to end with this idea and just back up even further. Let's talk about the word religion. It comes from the Latin and Greek word religio, or religare, and it means to link back or to connect or to join together. So why are we here? Why are we Christians or Jews or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists or Wiccans or whatever ideology or spiritual but not religious and all the labels right why i think we all want the same thing this this connection 
And so it means, by the way, essentially the same thing as yoga in the Hindu tradition, integration or unity, to take everything that's separate and bring it back into its original interconnectedness. So I'm going to just go bold here for a moment and suggest that the fundamental singular purpose of all religious ideology, it felt better when I was writing it. Now that I say it on a microphone, it's, I feel like I'm overreaching a little but. I'm gonna, what the heck? So the fundamental singular purpose of all religious ideology, ritual, and practice is to, fill, is, is, is to facilitate unification within and unification without. To help me stitch myself back together, all my brokenness, all my inner conflict, the paradoxes, and to connect me to you and to the cosmos. To rejoin the sacred weave of interconnectedness Everyone and everything is our neighbor. And the image here, of course, is an old photograph of, of three women um, who are weaving a rug. And we all love Navajo rugs. They're beautiful. But did you know that really these three women are theologians? That they are taking dye from seeds and animals and they are weaving it together with jute and other, and other threads that they have procured. And when they make that rug, they are ritually reenacting the interconnectedness of all energy, all matter, all forms, and all consciousness. This is the philosophy of the Dine that we call the Navajo. When they make these rugs, they are praying. And so that leaves us with more questions and answers, but I am so appreciate the opportunity to think through these things with you. And let's take some time now, and uh, we have a microphone over there. Thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. So there's a microphone, and someone's going to walk around with that. So raise your hand. I'd love to hear a comment, some, some question. Does this triggering something? Oh, good. We have a hand over here. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I have the microphone. Do it. And then, and then you're next. <laughs> and say, <laughs> Please. And say that um, I was very glad that you said all sentient beings, because to me, that includes a lot of animals. I'm an animal lover. And I think that we don't recognize, we are not smart enough to recognize the intelligence of many animals. Yeah, that's that's fair. And 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 while you're walking the mic to the other person there, this is a this is an ethical decision all of us must discern for ourselves. There are there are vegans in the room, there are vegetarians, there are omnivores, and so all of us must, in our own conscience and in our own life find the way that I can practice ahimsa. And ahimsa, or nonviolence, in, in Buddhist consciousness is not an absolute. It is the recognition that the fact that I am alive, I am going to cause some harm. My life is going to result in the death of other life forms. Every day I put thousands of calories of food in this hole in the front of my face. I'm about to do it again. And all of that food is made of formerly living things. Plants, sometimes animals. It's how the energy of the sun gets embodied in plants and then it becomes part of my body. You know, I didn't invent this system, <laughs> it's just how it works. But we can all decide how much harm we are willing to cause. You know, Gandhi, for example, was a vegetarian. But he said, I will never dogmatize about vegetarianism because harming other beings is necessary. When we carve out an acre of forest to grow wheat to feed our village, we're going to kill all kinds of snakes and rabbits and bugs. And um, the Buddha also told his monks, you know, we are vegetarians, but we don't have jobs. We eat other people's food. <laughs> we get to somebody's house, and if they feed us goat stew, Buddha said, just, just eat it. Your compassion now is for the host who sacrificed their money and their time to feed you. So I'm fascinated by those sort of gray areas, but I'm with you about how I love how Buddhism includes all sentient beings so that we take into account all conscious beings and not just uh, people. Yeah, please. 
Well, first of all, thank you for enlightening us. <laughs> As always, very fascinating. Uh, I just want to go back to your first comment about religion. <clears throat> and you know, we have diff different people on the spectrum. But what I tell my children is, by their fruits you shall know them. I don't care what you label yourself, you call yourself a Christian, but if there's hate, racism, sexism, war, anything that has to do with violence, you're, you're not, you know, by your fruits you shall be known. And even Jesus says that. You know, when he said, uh, get away from me, and the people say, but I preached in your name. I did this in your name. And he said, where were you when I was hungry, thirsty, in prison, oppressed? He said, you weren't there, so he said, get away from me. He said, whatever you do to the least, you do to me. So that's part of the golden rule, too, to treat others the way you want to be treated. But, and the second comment I wanted to make, and last one, is <clears throat> when you talk about hospitality, I think you should mention the word compassion also, because hospitality seems not quite as deep as compassion. Just my No, I love that. I'll start with that second one. You're absolutely right. Um, you can get hospitality at a hotel. You know, I don't think they uh, are caring for your soul necessarily. But so I absolutely agree with you. How about hospitality as a baseline <laughs> upon which we can build? Um, but to your first point, I, I think about that so much, too. And, and, you know, there's that scene that to me is the most electrifying scene in the Gospels. And it's that it's the night of Jesus's. Well, it's Jesus's last night. And he's in that upstairs room with his disciples and they're having the last supper. And they're probably not all sitting on the same side of the table like da Vinci painted it, but I digress. But at the Last Supper, of course, y'all remember what happened. He, um, you know, this is my body, this is my blood, all that stuff. But after dinner, what does he do? He doesn't, you know, hey, well, let me make one long theological speech. He gets on, a, he, he gets a bucket and a towel and he gets on his knees and he crawls around and he washes all of his disciples' feet. And he says a few things, and I'll paraphrase. He says, you know, in the future, people will know who my followers are by how well they love one another. And so thank you for everything you just shared, because those are really powerful passages too, and I just, just to add that one to it. It seems to me unmistakable that if we are even halfway interested in walking any kind of Christian path, that it would have to entail focusing not on what I believe or what others believe, but focusing instead on how do I show up every day in the rooms that I walk into? How do I treat the other drivers on the road? How do I treat the, the, in per, the person on the insurance helpline that finally answers my call after being on on hold for 45 minutes how do i treat that person who's just working for crap wages in some phone bank how do i treat her or him and that's the test that we are always undergoing and so those those can those changes require discipline and surrender and optimism but the good news is when you start w learning how to walk that way a little bit better, your own suffering l begins to lift off of you because you're no longer in the business, the exhausting business of constantly judging everyone and everything you see and building hierarchies of who's better and who's not as good. That is exhausting. And so you're really, again, like the Dalai Lama said, compassionate action is the highest form of self-interest. It starts just getting easier for me to be Peter Boland if I can treat you better. Please. I'm curious about uh, the question that stimulates the story of the, good of the neighbor. And it is, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Mm -hmm. Are there other religions that seek the same kind of question? 
um, or some, or what is it? What is the question that pushes them to understand what it means to be a good neighbor? Ah, that's really good. I, I have a lot of questions about that moment in the story too, and maybe there are others here who who are better Bible scholars than I am. I would love to know um, what that sentence really means in Greek, because the Gospels were written in Greek, right? What must I do in order to get eternal life? That phrase, eternal life, I want to unpack that a little bit, and I don't have the tools to do it today. But I'm going to go home and look at, look look that up. But um, I love how you took it to a more universal place. What is the what is what is at stake in Hinduism? What is at stake in Buddhism? Why would they even enter into that question of how should I treat other people? And it's a wonderful meditation question to inquire into. What do you think the answer might be? Theology of the of 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 this story, the human condition. Mm. Say some more about that. What do you mean, the psychology of the story? Here's a man that is seeking, I think, purpose and meaning in his life. Yeah, and that that it, that to me is the psychology behind mm. his question. What do I need to find? What what is it that I need to do? to be able to find purpose. That's how I understand the question, too. And, and again, especially in the context of what I understand, and I don't understand much, but what I understand about Jewish th consciousness or thinking or doctrine about the afterlife in the first century. And I wonder if eternal life is a kind of a Christian overlay. And if I found a Hebrew... Bible, an English language Hebrew Bible, would it not say eternal life? Would it say something else like righteousness? Like the way we modern folks might put it, a life of authentic, uh, a life of authenticity and, va and value and rich joy and satisfaction. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just <laughs> winging it here. What Aristotle called eudaimonia, to tap into the Greek philosophical tradition. For Aristotle, that was the purpose of life of human beings to attain eudaimonia, which we struggle to translate into English as happiness, but really a deep and rich satisfaction to know that you have worked hard to uh, bring to fruition all of your potentials through discipline and, and effort, but you've also become moderate in your views, you've become friendlier, you've become compassionate, and that is the good life according to that Greek tradition. We, we Christians cl claim that it is God's grace that gives us that eternal life. But the other part of that is that we are called then to be gracious. Yeah. And is that not part of the issue of loving thy neighbor? Nice, yeah. No, it's a wonderful conversation that in Christianity is always worth having, it, that, that we don't, build our own best life all on our own. We do it in relationship with grace. And in fact, we receive more than we create. And, and so the question always becomes, uh, or the challenge becomes, it seems to me in Christianity, um, do I just sit back on the couch and wait for God's grace to fix everything? And that clearly is a misread of, 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 of the whole idea that there is praxis, that there is right action that who you are and how you talk and how you behave and act is important. Please, where's, where's the mic? Oh, we have back here and then we'll come to you. Please. Dr. Dr. Boland, thank you very much for your lecture. It's excellent. My, my reason for asking this question or just saying something, I said I'm a teacher mm -hmm. and children and adults pick up something from, from who's speaking. Yeah. And so you're just being here I'm picking up things from you that I can take back to my, my students. Like I'll notice my students in class, after a while they begin sounding like me. And it just was like, how did they do that? But I think they're, they're so clear and they haven't been uh, corrupted, I'll use that word, uh, that they're able to see my intent. And if I can 
if all of us can exploit that. You know, think about it when you meet somebody. Even they change, they change when you smile at them. I practice doing this in other classes, and they don't know who I am, and I'll just, somebody be, you know, hi. Oh, and they're all, you know, they change from being whatever they were, kind of negative. But this has been so good to know that we can all do good works. We can all make positive, powerful changes just by being who we are. But you have to be mindful because those bad feelings, for no reason, <laughs> pop in. Thank you. Thank you for that. Beautifully said. You know, real quick, I know we have another question up here. Can we, can we come up here to the front, Lemby? Yeah, I've got you, Marjorie. I'll be there in a minute. Okay. All right. Perfect. But let me, let me just throw this in real quick in response to that. Um, there's a passage, I think what you said about uh, teaching or presence is so important. It's been tough to do over Zoom these last two and a half years. But when you get into a room with people, there is an exchange, isn't it? It isn't there. And there's a line in the Katha Upanishad that I often think of where it's talking about how spiritual teaching works. And the phrase there is that between teachers and students, there's often something they call in that tradition spiritual osmosis. And osmosis is, now that's an English translation, I don't know what the Sanskrit word is, but y'all remember from biology class, osmosis is when the liquid contents of one cell move through the semi-permeable membrane through the space between the cells and enters the other cell through its semi-permeable membrane and becomes part of the substance of that cell. It's a metaphor. But it's about what happens when we really look at each other and really share perspectives and experiences. I remember my favorite teachers, you know, from grade school, high school, college, I couldn't tell you one thing they said or one thing they did. <laughs> but I remember how I felt when I was with them. That's that Maya An An uh, Angelou line that we all love, right? People will never remember what you said. They'll never remember what you did. But they will never forget the way that you made them feel. And is there something that moves between us wordlessly that is at the heart of real teaching? And real, uh, so I, th I thank you for that observation. Back here, and then we'll come up here. Yeah, I, I have a theory. If you took a white person, a black person, an Asian person, and a Native American, or a Native person globally, yeah. and you lined them all up, and you said, okay, which one would you want to be? And until you get to the point where it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who, if I'm black, white, Asian, or a Native uh, inhabitant of a, of a country, it doesn't matter. So until you get to that point or that you have a policy that is written that doesn't discriminate or cause discrimination against another person because they're different, you know, that's, it's, it isn't until you walk in that person's shoes that you understand what they're all about. And once you understand what they're all about, color doesn't make any difference at all. And so, uh, I mean, that's been my experience. If I get to know somebody, I don't see color or refer to them that way. So I hope someday in the future that will happen because we do, in, in the Holocaust thing when I watched it, what was really outstanding to me was that nobody really thought that that was really happening because in your mind you think nobody could do that. Yeah. And until, <laughs> until you see it full force and, the, and it hits you, then you, you really understand, oh my God, what was, we were being told was correct. And that's the sad part, that it is really hard to wrap your mind around things yeah. that you just think couldn't happen. So I think that's what the, the film and the going on really was so impressive to me, was yeah. that... I think there was that feeling that it couldn't happen. This, this is just some, something that's made up or exaggerated. And yeah. that's what's really kind of sad, that we, we ignore things because we don't think. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to absorb. You know, it, I, I took away something a little different from the film, and that was how many Americans knew about it and didn't care. How many Americans were so deeply committed to anti-Semitism that that's happening to those other people in other place. It was 
the Holocaust was pretty well published in American press. And, and so this old idea that nobody knew, um, that, that idea is one of the things that's kind of falling apart. Um, there's a reason they sandblasted Charles Lind Lindbergh's portrait off that building down there at the airport, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, he got canceled. <laughs> yeah. uh, because he was a virulent anti-Semitist, along with his friend Hen Henry Ford, who was another favorite of Hitler, right? Ford was a virulent anti-Semite. He blamed the Jews for everything. I've, I've, I've had a lot of Fords in my life. I've enjoyed them. <laughs> but um, there, were, there was something in the water in the United States in the mid-20th century that made it possible for that to go, the Holocaust to go much further than it did. But, but I know what you mean about it, it's just too horrible to conceive, so that can't be happening. That's part of the dynamic, too. Please. I have um, two comments. Yeah, one, and one, yeah, this will be our last no, question. It'll march you up your notes. Yeah, okay. okay, these two. <laughs> one thing that strikes me as you're talking is that, that old saying that the, the only thing necessary for evil to win is for good people to do nothing. Yeah, it's classic, huh? And the other thing is, if I have to choose somebody I want to be, I want to be a tall, thin blonde. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be blonde before I took the razor to what was left. Thank you. Uh, my comment is really to give you kudos and to cheer for the fact that you mentioned Native Americans and you said, unless we really talk about and admit to our wrongs, we're not going to be able to resolve anything going forward. Yeah. No, none of us was hanging black people up in, <laughs> by a tree. None of us killed Native Americans, but we know that our ancestors were there. Yeah. Talk about it. It's not going to make you a bad person. Right. That's what I wanted to say. Oh, I appreciate that feedback, really, really. And, and finally, then I'll just... Uh, It's hard to wrap up something like this, but we do need to end because we're probably getting hungry and it's lunchtime. But, but um, I really appreciate that, you know. And and I over the last um, handful of years, ever since the summer of George Floyd, and really before that, when when the when the when the Charlottesville march happened, a lot of us, and I'm talking about myself now, a lot of us sort of white liberal folks kind of uh, got woken up a little bit and realized it's not good enough for me just to have my opinions about things. I have to do things in various communities that I'm involved in. You know, we, we dove in, uh, uh, I used to go to the Unity Center, uh, Reverend Wendy Craig Purcell's amazing church off Miramar, and we broke into black cohorts and white cohorts and we met separately for a year and just talked all this stuff out because it was important for black people to be in a room to talk outside of the presence of white people so they didn't have to code switch. And then white people could talk about all their evolutions through all of these challenges. And then we put the two groups together and it was electrifying. And we read all the books, Ibram Kendi and, and you know, um, Rob and D'Angelo and, and all of that stuff. We did all the anti-racism work. I see by some posters around here, y'all are going through some of those same things and that's what this year is about. So good people just being willing to be a little uncomfortable and to, and to sit with each other and, and to see each other, to see color, to see difference and to love all of it as the presence of God, as the presence of the divine in that Hindu sense. That's a constant touchstone for me. So thank you all, and I'll turn it back over to you. never said what I'm about to say in, an, in any lecture I've ever been to before, but you honestly gave me goosebumps. All right. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Peter. This has been a joy, an absolute joy. Thank you for bringing it all together so beautifully.